What's going on guys? This is Pete and in today's video we're going to continue our crusade to get really, really good at No Limit Hold'em cash games. I just played a 35 minute session while I was setting up for this video generating some spots. I pressed record or so I thought and then I played poker I realized at the end I hadn't recorded any of it. So we're going to go over these really cool exciting hands that just came up in a replayer format instead. This was the session, this was the result of it, I know sometimes from time to time you guys like to see graphs, you're like animals that way. The videos with the graphs seem to get more views and likes and comments. You can explain that to me in the comments section. Why do you love graphs so much? This one looks like a swan or a dragon maybe? I can see the appeal. But yeah, it was a solid session, we played a lot of very important nitty gritty cool little spots. And then we stacked the same recreational player twice in a row. Which is really fun and I'll show you how that went down at the end of this video. Let's get rolling. So the journey begins with the 6-7 of spades. Going to be doing a bit of reflecting today on my play, hence the title. Going to be doing a bit of introspection, asking myself whether I played okay. It's important that when you have a losing session that you build up your sort of self-confidence and your security with your play by analysing hands and making sure you did a good job. And equally it's important when you have a winning session that you scrutinise yourself and make sure you can find any mistakes that you make so you can get something useful out of it instead of just basking in the glory of being up a few buy-ins. So we open 6-7 of spades, we get 3-bet, I think this hand is extremely close in EV between calling and folding, I think my opponent here is some sort of unknown weaker player. Which makes me think that their range is constructed way too linearly, and linear means from the top down, without enough bluffs, without the calling region in the middle that's separated by value and bluff on either side. So we call. The flop is queen jack 7, we hit bottom pair, villain picks. A fairly weaker player, typical sizing, there's nothing wrong with the sizing here whatsoever. I'm not saying this is bad, like let's call him a fish. I'm just saying I already suspected this was a weaker player and this is further evidence. I peeled the flop, I don't think, against the bigger size and against a stronger range that we're actually able to raise here. I think you can raise hands like bottom pair against merged small c-bet ranges. I don't think there's much merit to this here, I think this hand is too mediocre, I think villain is polar enough here. On this texture they have enough hands that will just want to jam that they're going to re-deny our equity to us sometimes if we raise here, so I think call is the play for sure in this spot. Although I will say that against someone weaker this is actually getting a bit closer to fold than we would like, this would be a really standard continue against most ranges, but against a recreational player that's maybe a bit tighter and too linear pre, this is a very bad board for us actually, it's much worse than you'd expect it to be. If you can hear my chicken going Arr! outside then just live with it. The window's open. I can't be bothered getting up and closing it. There may be some chicken noises in this video. Queen of Clubs. We check. My plan was to, I don't generally plan ahead very often. Like I don't say like I'm gonna check with the intention of. But in a spot like this I think there's nothing much else to think about. There's, it's okay to plan our next action. I am gonna fold to a bet here. One reason for that is just that I have a fairly bad hand, like I just don't have a lot of redraw here, the 6 has been counterfeited by the Queen. So usually when you have a pair on the board you have the sort of blessing of being able to hit two pair or trips and you have 5 outs, but here the 6 is going to be pretty bad against Villain's value range, so not a redraw out at all. So probably going to be check folding here in equilibrium, but also especially in reality against what I think is an underbluff node. The river is interesting, there are two options here, you can go for a very small block bet probably in the vicinity of about 5th pot, or you can check. The block bet is a bit misleading to a lot of you guys watching this, so you might have this idea that a block bet's function is to stop the opponent from betting. That's not really the whole thing, like the block bet needs to either be a value bet or a bluff, so I need to basically think that my hand is good enough against my opponent's range that I can value bet. If I go like 5th pot, maybe that's the case, but it does rely on them actually peeling like ace high a lot of the time and stuff like that. And I don't actually think people are going to find the necessary calls even against quarter pot or fifth pot here. So I did elect to check. The old classic check evaluate. Coaches that don't know what they're doing, they love to say that. Why don't you just check evaluate the turn? Like, why don't you just say check the turn? What the hell is this evaluate? Like, how is this part of the line? You should always be evaluating, you bozo. Always. So shut up. Shut up. Anyway, we check. Bellin checks back. We win. This time they have ace-king. Um, I think this is a better line in practice. I think it's less of a clear bluff catch this spot. I'm probably going to check fold this river against what I think is a weaker player with too linear of a preflop range. Although bet check bet can be overbluffed, it's less so in a 3-bet pot and it's less so against people with too st strong or linear of a range preflop. So I'm probably going to check fold the river here because I don't think Villain has landed here with enough combos of like the 10-5 suited that they should be 3-betting pre and all of the other combos of that nature. Let's go for an open here with the queen-jack. 
This is a board on which I'll use big bets, villain folds. I can check this hand back sometimes. I'm not pure betting this hand. Bet and check do have the same EV here in theory. And I do like to put this in my checking range. I don't see a reason not to. So absolutely fine with this. If this was like a bad stationary weaker player, I would bet and I would just consider my hand like a value bet because I'm drawing so nutted here and I have the spade as well. I would just think I'm, I'm pot building for lots of really juicy advantageous nodes in the future I can value bet on. But apart from that, I'd be mixing, I'd be betting this at a higher frequency than normal for my range here, which probably bets about 50% of the time. Okay, fives. I think this is a call and only a call because villain is 3x, we can go ahead and make the very likely judgment that they're going to be a recreational player. Flop a set, good times. This will be a pure check race. But alas, villain checks back. We head over to the three of spades turn. Now, how should we think about this spot? I'll, I'll show you what you do. What you do, which is wrong, is this. I got a bet, man. I gotta get value here, man. I gotta get value. That's wrong. What you should say here is that there are two ways of getting value. We have this rule in the Carrot Poker School. We talk about this a lot right from grade one, but especially in grade two, lecture five, where we cover the out of position game and the concept of urgency. The rule goes as follows. Whenever you can check raise for value, you don't have to bet. That's not universally true. There are exceptions to this rule, but usually this is a really good starting point. So if you think about it here, this is a node on the game tree where people delayed c-bet a ton. They bet their air here. They're like, oh, he checked twice. I'm going to bet now. I'm going to win the pot a lot. And they're right. Most people are overfolding this node when they check. When I say node, I just mean point in the game tree, like decision point in the hand. Given this node is bet very often, we do not have to bet here ourselves. We can bet here ourselves. And the, the strategy I'd concoct here would be to overbet or check. And overbetting is fine, but check raising with a large, large sizing with a very polarized range is also completely fine. And this time I roll and I roll a check because I don't actually know what is better. If I knew that the fish was really stab happy, I would check every time. If I knew that this fish was really check happy and passive, I would bet every time. But I didn't know. When they check back a second time, it does begin to skew the player type towards being someone who on balance is a bit more passive. This isn't universally true, of course, but I do think it's a pattern. So now in game theory, I think again I can check raise because I'm out of position. If you can check raise, you don't have to bet. And I also block the fourth pair here, which is a very typical example of a hand that will check back twice and then call. When you block the middle of your opponent's range, you have polarizing blockers. When you have polarizing blockers, this is all grade two, lecture five, you will cause your opponent's range to be more polar through your own card removal. That will increase villain's bet frequency slightly. And therefore, GTO and solvers are going to be like, oh, actually, you can check raise. <laughs> but I think someone that's checked back twice rather quickly, check turn quickly here, we don't see that because we delete record it like a baboon. But he did check back quickly. And therefore, I think over bet's going to perform best. I'm tailoring my hand to my equity, my sizing to my equity, because I have like 100% equity. I use a very large sizing. This is the biggest bet in my toolkit of bets at this point. If I had a weaker hand like Jack-4, I would not use the sizing, or 8-9, or I would use a different sizing. I have bluffs for all of those sizes as well, if I'm caring about that. Right now, well, I do, but I'm not caring about that right here. All I'm thinking here is, let's go really big, because we have a really big hand. Poker's simple. Will I increase my fold equity with this size? Yes. Is that a problem? No. Am I trying to maximize my call frequency? No. If I was doing that, I'd bet one big win. I'm trying to maximize EV. We win more when we get called. We get called. At eight, 9 let's move on. Three, four in the big, we defend very standard. This is gonna be super high frequency raise because we have the unblockers to the folding range. They're folding a jack or a nine or an eight or a king or a queen. They're not folding a three or a four because they just don't have a three or a four, really. They're not folding pairs here. We go for the raise. I think if this was a, if you're playing 50 NL, you can probably like raise this every time. See, if you're playing an anonymous game, like you play on like Ignition or one of these, you know, godforsaken sites on the other end of the universe. If you play on a site like that and it's anonymous, you can just raise every single fucking time here. Like you don't have to care about how much of a baboon you become with your raise frequency. This is something I need to be a bit more careful of because I'm playing in a game with known screen names and my trademark carrot man avatar and regs who obviously know who I am because I'm mad famous. They're gonna they're gonna start reacting eventually if I just raise all of these hands all the time. So I mix call and raise here. Can you call here? I don't actually know actually if you can call here. I think you probably can because the bet is tiny. It's like fourth pot and the river is still a node where we can bluff. So if it does go check check on turn we always bluff river and we bluff river with an excess of fold equity surplus to what we need to break even. That's how game theory works and nodes where we call flop and he checks back turn. 
So that's all very well and good and he folds and there's nothing else to say and now we move on to another fives hand and you can call out the small blind guys and maybe you think you can't because someone once said don't call out the small blind you were like okay and you remembered it for like eight years and never called out the small blind that was a shame for you actually you can call out the small blind because it's fine you could simplify to never calling out of the small line, but we've run preflop sims, simulations of preflop that have the rake structure of like 10 and L. And in those sims, we see that you can still call small line versus under the gun. You can pick those up at carrotcorner.com if you want some ranges sensitive to the, the rake at your stakes. Villain calls in a big blind here, and it's ace, jack, nine, two tone, and we start with the check, and that's the end of the hand. I just want to illustrate preflop that you can do that. Basically, this is like a live session. You're seeing every hand that went to the flop. I've got a filter on here that's called VPIP softflop. So preflop, preflop opportunities, VPIP, flop, flop actions as opportunities, softflop, end of filter, that's it. Open a seven, king eight seven. This is against a fellow coach. I know this coach, he coaches on run at once. I won't say anymore. He's probably good at cards. I would think if he's a coach on run at once. Check, 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 check. Standard stuff. Middle of range. I could bet flop. I'm mixing bet with his hand on the flop. The ace of hearts makes that viable. It's in this five outs. There's a lot of like valuey nutty stuff going on here. So you can definitely bet this hand for a mix of denial and value in the flop. It's fine. On the turn, we check back because at this point in the game tree, we just have absolute middle. On the river, we still have absolute middle. I'm not so sure the ace five is a pure check. Is ace five a pure check on this particular run out? I'm wondering. This hand has been severely demoted. This is very near the bottom of my opponent's range. Maybe he's mixing bet here, maybe he's not. But I'm not so sure that this hand is always going to check. Should we ask the solver? I think we should ask the solver and find out. Here's a sim. Magic. So they check. And we're meant to bet 60% globally, a seven. Have a look at this. With the Ace of Hearts, it's almost a pure bet. I was betting this 75% of the time, because I only do milestones of 25, 50, or 75, or 0, or 100. That's it. As you can see here at the bottom right, the Ace Hearts 7x combo is like 90%. Does that make me bad at cards? No, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of stupid solvery noise. It's fine. So we check back, and then the turn came something. I remember it was a 10 of spades, or if it was a 9 of clubs. So my main question here is like, now it's a pure check. Why our showdown value went up? It went up. There's only one more card to come and villain checked again. So now we're in a, a node where we know we're not making a flush. We know we're probably not making trips or two pair, or at least we're closer to knowing that than we were on the flop. So while our showdown value kind of went up against villain's second check, or maybe it didn't go up, but it didn't get much worse. Our ability to value bet and win really big pots with a mighty hand has diminished significantly. So this is no longer a hybrid bet of value and denial. It's now a check. We talk about hybrids a lot in grade three of the Carrot Poker School. This is not a hybrid, it's showdown value. So we check back again. On the river here, we don't actually have the offsuit aces. This range is actually a little bit too tight. I think I used the wrong range preflop. You should have some ace five off and stuff like that, of course. But anyway, if we look at a hand like ace five, the interesting pattern here is that you do want to bluff his villain, but only when you have the busted flush draw. And this is really interesting with the offsuit ones. It's probably going to be the case that if you have like one heart, you can bet and when you don't, you check. And the idea there is that we would have bluffed our heart hands very often on the flop or the turn. So we don't have a lot of heart air here. So the hearts are actually going to unblock the air that we do have. And that's going to be a good thing for villain's fold equity. So that's why it's pure to bluff the busted flush draw here, but not pure to bluff the other ones. But it turns out that this world is not so good for villain that they can be bluffing random ace high here. They do start pure bluffing when they get down to queen high ace high is still checking for a tiny bit of pot share so villain obviously does a good job of understanding that interestingly here though we should note that villain's hand did actually contain one heart it wasn't the most relevant heart it wasn't the ace but the five of hearts is interesting it's a better five to bluff with than the other fives for the same reasons so maybe this hand isn't a bluff but with ace of hearts it is or something like that okay ace jack villain bets small blind here we peel this is a strong reg and this is actually the villain we battled against, who's called My Name Is Carl. We battled against him in the last installment of this. I may actually just turn on player names here, because I think it's kind of cool to actually see who is who here. So there you go. This is My Name Is Carl. He goes ahead and bets half pot. He stacked us a couple of times last time, so obviously we're out for blood. I think this is a, a pure call. I mean, you could raise some hands of this nature, but a little bit lower down in showdown value. So things like Jack-10 with a heart, King-Jack with a heart, King-10 with a heart definitely raise candidates. I think ace-jack is a bit too high up here in this configuration in position, at least. 
out of position should be three bet in the swap sometimes if we raise, so that's what we need to be a bit wary of. The six of hearts, I think we have a mixed bluff in this hand. I think we can definitely go ahead and bluff here, and we can definitely check and delay our bluff until the river. If the texture runs out really dry, we may decide we have enough showdown value to check down, but on many runouts, we will plan on actually bluffing the river. Not this one, because we hit the jack of diamonds, but villain goes ahead and bets about 60% of the pot. I've noticed this player use this sizing a lot, it just appears to be like a, an unfamiliar size that people aren't used to facing, like we're used to facing block bet, we're used to facing big bet. This is neither here nor there, so maybe that's the reason for it. When you have a hand like this, your first job is to understand, do I have a bluff catcher or do I have a value beater? Do I have a hand that could beat some of villain's value bets? Well, is he value betting ace jack here? I probably would think so for a smaller sizing, but I don't think so for this sizing. I think the sizing is probably about queen x plus. I'm not 100% sure on that, so maybe this hand is like flirting with the idea of chopping with a value bet, maybe. But usually the only thing we'll beat is bluffs, but that doesn't mean that we fold, because we only beat a bluff. I remember like back in the day people used to say, just fold, you only have a bluff catcher. It's like, yeah, but villain is over bluffing this node. So obviously this is a strong player, I don't want to like accuse them of over bluffing here. A lot of people would over bluff nodes like this, because it's quite hard in the wide configuration of small blind versus big blind to keep your bluffs in check, especially if you don't check enough good hands on the turn. So bad players, weaker players, will overbluff this node a lot. Not all of them, but many of them. Strong player, not so likely. And so I want to really think about my blockers here. So I have the Jack of Hearts. What does that mean? Well, similarly to what we just looked at, if Villain had a heart, they would very often be bluffing the turn. But this doesn't actually matter when the Jack pairs, right? So the Jack of Hearts isn't a negative blocker anyway, but it still wouldn't be anyway, even if this river didn't give us a pair because Villain bets hearts in the turn, right? This is a scattered aggression spot where villains reach the spot by going bet check bet, not bet bet bet. So the heart blockers are, are not actually bad in these situations at all, especially when they have a pair. The ace seems like a kind of neutral card. The jack is clearly like quite positive in some ways as well because it blocks two pair like jack eight, jack seven, jack six suited, queen jack, pocket jacks. I think this hand is like far better than what we usually have in this spot blocker wise. I think it's got above average blockers overall. I don't think that the ace is a negative blocker because I think it's mainly going to be like king high, ten high that bluffs in the river here. Some ace high for sure, but not lots. So I think this is on balance just a, a positive hand and a call. Classic bluff by villain, really good bluff in the river. You definitely want to use this one. This world is quite good for your range. The jack bails your range out a bit. You have the bottom of your range, you're unblocking a lot of folds. This is definitely a combo you want to bluff river with, and I think this is a combo we want to call with. So I think a normal hand by both parties. Another flat with fives out of the blinds. Not much to see here. Just further reiterating the point that when you have weaker players at the table, note the stack size, you want to make these calls. King Jack, go for an open. Call from the big blind. Jack 10 for a two tone. Going to use big bets on this texture. Betting range, maybe, I don't know, 60% of the time. Hand, let's say 75. Use my high bet frequency villain folds. This is just catching all kinds of hands, right? So you can just see what a normal session looks like. Three bet here by small blind. We peel. Looks good. I think even if we have the club here, which we do, I still don't think we can peel third pot with this hand in this configuration. If we're against big blind, I think we can maybe peel because big blind has a way higher density of like 10, nine suited, ace, five suited, etc. But small blind is really quite linear and top down, like big card heavy. So this board is extremely good for small blinds range. And I think under pairs, there's two aspects to them. One, do they have a club? And, and two, how vulnerable are they to villains redraw and how many of their mergers are they beating? So three aspects actually. This hand does have the club going for it, but it's so low down that it's losing to merges like tens and jacks that people will bet here because they'll bet all of their range. And furthermore, it's very vulnerable when it is ahead. Villain will always have two overs. That's not the case if we have two jacks. So I'd, I'd call jacks with a club here. I would not call jacks without a club and I would not call, or maybe I could call jacks, but I wouldn't call tens without a club. I would call tens and jacks with a club. I wouldn't call sevens without or with a club. That's how I'm thinking about it. Queen seven, open from cutoff, bottom of range call. Mixing in quite a bit of big bet with this hand. If the global frequency is about 40 here, I probably bet this hand about 50% of the time. I roll a bet this time, villain calls. Five of clubs river goes check check. I think I can bet this turn because I don't have diamonds. I think if I have the queen and seven of diamonds here, I have a pure give up. This is not a terrible spot for me. My range quite likes the five actually. Okay, so does his, but we make some very invincible over pair now. It becomes two pair and stops him redrawing to a, bear, to a two pair that can beat us. So this is a good, decent world for my range. I want to be quite unselective with my bluff grabbing here. So I could grab this one as a bluff sometimes. I roll a check this time. Seven on the river. Again, I block a lot of like two pair combos, although with the five, they're a bit less important. 
but over pairs are going to be turned so often that I don't think this matters. Against the smaller sizing now, again, it's like almost third pot, but a bit bigger. It's like the block equivalent of his almost half pot, but a bit bigger sizing that we saw before. I guess with the Queen of Spades, we're not really blocking that many bluffs. We're blocking Queen Jack off and Queen Jack of Spades and Queen Nine, actually. Yeah, maybe this isn't a great bluff catch, but we are blocking pocket sevens, which could take this line, just trying to like induce something as it blocks a, a bluff catch. We're blocking like some boats that could do the same. We're blocking like 10, 7, 8, 7. Looks like a, a mix to me, but maybe a pure call, actually. I'm leaning towards call. I do call here. I think it's probably a pure call. I think the hands that are mixes or something weaker. 10-5, I mean, going for the small bet here. Okay, so Villain wants to bet small when he unblocks my raising range and wants to bet bigger usually when he blocks it. Here he blocks a 5, which if I ever had I would raise, but I don't have that anyway. A 10, I don't think I'm going to... I think I would raise a 10. So he actually blocks my raising range here. He doesn't block any bluff raises, so if he thinks I'm like over bluffing, I would go bigger with his hand because I think that actually... Okay, you block a 10, maybe it's not like an overbet hand, but I would think it's like, maybe it can overbet, unblocking an 8, a 7. I think probably block is okay, but I think overbet or B75 is also good. I'm not sure, I would have thought the hands that want to block would be things that unblock the 10 that might raise them for value. So if I had the case 10 here, I'm probably raising, right, or King 10 or something. I don't know, it's kind of interesting. He does unblock over pair, but I don't think I have too many of them. Anyway, I'm getting lost in the weeds, I think the hand is fine, probably by both players. Aces. 865, going to be checking back this board really often. This is a key spot I may have screwed up, and I want to really scrutinize myself with this hand. I may have got this hand super wrong. So check, check. I'm going to check back very often here. We'll look at a sim in just a second. I have not seen its verdict yet, so I don't know if it's going to condemn or condone my play. Villain over bets turn. So I, I think here the value range that they're repping is mostly going to be two pair plus. But I do think there's some nines and tens in here also that didn't three bet pre sometimes. Maybe some ace eight, although I think that's a little bit then so we do call here i think this is the only play the king of hearts comes with reverend villain block so he's gone over bet and then block so if he just gone like big bet turn block or block block this is a really obvious raise i think it might still be a raise even against over bet because villain does river the king in game i forgot all about the prospect of him just having king x of diamonds here or king seven or king nine or king four i forgot all about that massive massive hand group and I called, and I'm pretty sure this is a blunder. I think this is bad, because in-game I was thinking it's only really ace, eight, nines, tens that takes this line that can pay off a raise, it's like a value bet here. Because the turn sizing was so big, he's just not gonna have like a bad eight or sevens or six x, right? It's just his hands just don't exist for over bet on the turn. Queen's jacks don't exist pre-flop really, they're three betting a lot, so I, in my mind there wasn't enough of a, a sub range that I could raise for value against here. But then I remembered about the king, because lo and behold, that's what he actually had. And I'm pretty sure I should just be raising aces in this spot. I unblock all of the king x kind of hands that you can have. And I do think that people will not put enough of their good hands in this in this sizing normally. So I think I misplayed this. And honestly, I was suffering a bit from like a recent memory. I don't know if you saw the last episode of Cash Game Mastery, where I actually jammed normally on the river against a block against my name is Carl. And they had rivered the flush. And because of that, I think there was something at the back of my brain here. It wasn't calling the shots. It wasn't like fully in control, but there was like a voice at the back of my brain, a kind of emotional voice that was like, don't want to reopen. Your range is kind of capped. Billing could jam on you. Like bad things could happen. If it's close, just call air on the side of caution. Let's see if the solver is going to tell me off. I kind of hope it does, because in a cathartic, sadistic way, I like being told off by the solver. Not in like a kinky way. It's a, it's a fucking solver. But I do kind of like to be, I like to know that I'm learning. I like to know that I've done something wrong sometimes because it means that I still have growing to do. Not that I think I'm actually a master of this game yet. I think I'm on the path to mastery, but I like it when I take another step towards that goal. So let's have a look at the sim. Here's the spot. They check. We have a small c-bet frequency, but this hand, we're basically not really c-betting. We check back. And the turn. Deuce of clubs followed by the king of hearts. So as you can see, there's a little bit of overbet. That's the darkest red shade here with nines and eights, but not even with tens. And then like, it's just really big value hands and bluffs for the most part. Actually, ace eight, like I said, does a little bit of it. I was really fucking close there. Pat on the head, Pete. Well done. I'm about to get shouted at on the river. So I need to like big myself up here so that my ego can take it. I can't take it. I can't take the criticisms. I once taught a guy that had that voice and said that. 
If you're a loyal Carrot Corner viewer, you will know that. You've seen me do that impression many times. If not, then I legit taught that guy, like 10 years ago, legit taught that person. Don't tell me I'm bad. I can't take it. If you're watching, shout out to you, my friend. Shout out to you. Anyways, it then went over a bit. Lol, call. Lol, call. What else can I do? King of Hearts. And because this card merges villain a little bit, you might think block is a thing here, but block is just not a thing. So maybe my thought process should just be, this isn't a thing. What's he doing? He's wacko. He's, he's lost his mind. Because apparently the King 7 of diamonds or whatever, any King 7 can just big bet. This is a pretty good hand. So block isn't a thing. So we're not going to get a very good node. Oh, it's actually indifferent. It's actually like, Pete, you know what? You do you. It's close. It's super close. In that case, I think I should raise because I think the pool will be underprotected exploitatively and I should just, and it won't 3-bet bluff me much. I think I can get away with this. I think this is just better unbalanced, but it's good to see that it's actually close. But villains shouldn't be using the, the really big sizing there. That's interesting. Okay, back to the replayer. Let's get through the rest of the session. Next thing that happened was we got kings. This is the end of the session now. We're about to play two spots against the same recreational player. There was blood and gore everywhere. This is where we got a little bit of that 2009 kind of gift. Remember back in 2009, guys? You probably don't because you're like fucking children and you're watching this like, oh, I was like 12 in 2009. I was 12 years old. Yeah, fuck you. This, I'm just jealous because I'm old. This is actually something that doesn't happen to me very often anymore, getting gifts. And this wasn't even like a major gift. This is actually a really cool technical hand. But the next one where the dude got really tilted where they got really tilted, this person, this man, this woman, whatever they were, whatever they still are, assume they still exist, it's only been an hour, we bet they call. The reason I go a bit bigger than like the quarter pot or third pot is twofold. One, I think villain is recreational because they have all lowercase letters in their name and they also have a number. And two, their three bet sizing was a bit weird, a little bit sus. Okay, it's not bad, but like most regs go like seven there. And three, I just don't recognize the player, so they're probably recreational because at this time in the morning, I know the regs. I play this time in the morning, I know the regs. So I go half pot-ish here, a little bit, little bit less than half pot. I think this is fine. This is a turn that really merges your opponent. Their range here is super merged and the SPR is super small. What do I mean by their range is merged? They have a few hand classes that have like 35% equity, that sort of thing, 30%, 28%, that sort of thing. They have fives, they have eights, they have tens, they have nine eight, they have seven eight, they have six five, they have flush draws, and they have the ace x outs as well with like ace nine or something like the five out hand. So they have a very, very, very mergy, mediocre, middling equity hand. Of course, they have range, I should say. They, they also have some monsters, like they have sevens and they have nines and sixes or fours. But if you run into that, you're very unlucky. Most people don't even 3-bet 4s in this position or even 6s all the time. A lot of people flat with that. So I expect to see a ton of stuff like 8s here, 10s here, jacks here, queens here, floss draw. And when your opponent has sort of that kind of low to middling chunk of equity against your value hands, your value hands want to deny equity and rush value. There's urgency and there's a lot of denial. So I want to play jam on this turn. I want to play slight over bet jam. It doesn't matter exactly like how big this is compared to the pot. The idea is it could be 120% pot, it could be 80% pot, it could be pot sized. But we want to play this, this large jam here against such a merged range. If this board was like ace, ace, five, deuce, we don't do this. We just bet third pot again because their villain's range is way more polar. We don't use massive sizes against polar ranges. Carrot Poker School 101, basically all the way through raid one. You'll hear, hear me talk about this stuff if you pick up our school, which you can do over at carrotcorner.com. And on the river... It turns out that he had eights, which is very normal. The snowmen run in to the kings and lose. The very next hand, no, sorry, this hand happened in between. I called. I called. I called. And I folded. I didn't recognize this player. This is an overbluffed line that I should actually call against, against regs. The thing is, when fish start overbetting, they tend to have it a lot. If I knew this was a reg, I would actually just call here because I think this line is pretty overbluffed and I block sets in two pair. But against a fish, and I didn't know the player, they may be a fish, they may not be. 
I was hesitant to make this call, so I did fold for now, but I left this spot with a distinct feeling that I actually quite like calling here against certain regulars who are kind of using the slight overbet as an overbluffed line. There's a lot of coaching for profit stables and coaches out there that will tell their students to use small overbets as bluffs and bigger overbets for value. I've told my students to do similar things. So this is a bit sus, I'm not gonna lie. I was a bit preoccupied by the hand on the other table occurring simultaneously, but if I could redo this and I was confident villain was a reg, I'd definitely call, but I just wasn't. Against a weaker player, I think this is not great, but the sizing looks reggy, right? I don't think weaker players use the sizing very often, so already there's some induction we can do there. And this was the very next hand on the table where we just stacked Sanja, or another table popped up at the same time. Like basically it was like the snowman hand where he had the snowman and we had the kings. That was on screen at the same time as that other hand. And then this hand replaced the, the kings versus eights hand on the other table. The zoom game, so it's all wild and fast and furious. So we three bet his queen here, no brainer. Villain snap called, like very quickly called the three bet, which was like good. We've just stacked this guy. He's now snap calling our three bets. This is 2009. This is like vanilla stacker, a recreational kind of stuff that you don't get every day now at 200 zoom, unfortunately. I went for small here and my thinking was this. I think both sizes here are viable, like half pot or small. I went for small because I felt that he just saw me bet bigger for value. So maybe there are some worlds where the recreational player now decides that because this small bet is different to what I had when I had a value hand that I'm bluffing, or maybe just that it gives them rope to do something really crazy. Maybe they have a range that's too wide and a brain that's too aggravated. And if you add those two things together, they may overaggress against a small bet now. They just call. I think now that they're in call down mode, I think it's very likely that they're gonna station. So we just go for value on the turn. I don't, like check is a thing here in equilibrium, you can check. But I think villain is way, way too merged here and too passive here and too stationary here for that to be as good as bet. So I just bet. I think in reality, true EV wise, bet is better. Shout out true EV, hashtag true EV. True EV followers, a light in the comments. And then we have the five river on which we're gonna chop a lot, but this time we get snapped by King Seven Suited and it looks like the, the sort of idea that this was a tilt a fish and then stack a fish again spot was going on here. This is like very much something that I don't get every day anymore. Used to get this all the time back in the day, man, when poker was super soft, but these days you don't get this a lot. I don't even think villain's call down is bad in theory. In truth, I'm never bluffing here ever because it's too likely that I'm against someone that's gonna station me at this point. So yeah, I'm basically just only value betting here when I shove, so they're losing 100% of the time, so they shouldn't call. But in theory, they can. All right, guys, let me know what you think. Remember, all our stuff is over at carrotcorner.com. Do sub to the channel so you get notified when our videos come out. Do smash the like button. It really helps me keep doing this. I know that sounds really trivial, but it does help. And do comment and do check out carrotcorner.com for all of our paid content. More free content coming your way on YouTube and Twitch very soon. Bye-bye.